All right, Don, what are we going to be talking about tonight? Now's a good time to think about ordering bees, doing your uh, checkups in your hives, doing your maintenance, doing cha check uh, chains outs, getting everything set up for winter. Uh, we're going through doing our treatments and stuff like that. Uh, and I, I got my sign, appreciate that, and it looks good. Ken took a picture of me smiling out there, but a sign, maybe I make a few dollars with that now. Uh, and uh, if you're wanting to take classes, I know the price went to $1,000, but I'm open for bartering trading. I always need uh, building done here, other stuff. So if you can't afford that there, we can trade it out and work it. We wanna get you educated. Uh, my main reason from going from the 500 to 1,000 is we get too many basic beekeepers that wanna just take up time and then they find out this is a lot of work and then they kind of drop out. So I'm trying to devote my time to people that wanna make a living at it. And I'm here to help you get down the road and, and do that and make a living, and show you what no one else wants to show you. Uh, because when you start to make a living, everybody thinks you're gonna make a dollar more than them and everything becomes top secret. So, uh, and I repeat a lot of times, there's no secrets in beekeeping. It's basically hard work and basic uh, common sense stuff. So people who want to get into it, I think now's the best time. There's a lot of bees that are being lost. Uh, there's a lot of older beekeepers with the knowledge that are they're getting old, dying off, and and there's just no one out there wanting to teach the stuff. And there's a lot of this stuff that's just common sense, and people jump in and they want to have all the fancy words and all the technical stuff. And you don't need that. You just need a square box, put these little bugs in there, and feed them and keep them happy, and they stay on there with you. So. I know there's a lot of people ready to start asking questions. So if you're thinking about going that route or, you know, if you want to get into doing pollinating or doing the honey thing, I'll teach you to do that. But I'll tell you ahead of time, the money is going to be in selling bees. Uh, we talk about that a lot with students. Uh, people jump in it and want to start making honey. And right away, they're selling a quart of honey for $15 to go to the next bee meeting. Well, everybody's selling it for 13, so they drop to 12, and then pretty soon they're down to nine, then eight. Pretty soon we gotta pay them to take the honey off our hands. But you know, in the last 20, 25 years, bees are going up every year. I've never seen anybody cutting prices on bees, queens. And right now, if you got a problem in your hive going through it, and you bump that queen, or you find out you don't have a queen, Right now, there's not very many places to get a queen. So my advice is if you can find somebody who can supply you after September, you might just as well expect to pay almost double for a queen because it's like a lot of my students and myself. I have five frame nukes out there running, three frames or four frames with a laying queen. I'll pull a queen out of there, but my chances for that nuke right now to survive winter is very slim so i'm going to sell a queen for 35 dollars and go broke or i'm going to sell it for 50 or 75 and help somebody else out that's got a struggling hive uh if i left my nuke alone it's a minimum 175 and if it overwinters i it's 200 215 225 for a overwintered nuke so those are the things to consider i mean uh, you have to look at the economics of beekeeping I know everybody's all ready and primed for these questions, so don't be bashful. Get those hands up, people. Who's got the first question for Don? If you don't, I'll start calling on you. <laughs> I think it's your choice tonight, Don. Well, Jay's got a big smile. He must have something to tell us. <laughs> Go ahead, Jay. Oh, well, I'm glad to be back to the chats. I've missed them. Uh, I've been working, my daughter's building a house, so I've been working more on house than I have bees here lately. Well, you're getting all that uh, bee building material then, scrap wood. Well, when they get to that point, I will be. I'm fixed that clear about the electrical line and water line, about 1,200 feet. There you go. But I, How was the bees doing? Uh, I had a tough year this year. I lost a lot of hives. I don't know. Just every time I turned around, I was losing more hives. Well, you uh, got flooded over there pretty bad. 
we got flooded early and then it went to dry. Uh, I don't, I don't know really. And I talked to other people, they were running in the same problems. Uh, so I replaced queen. All right. At one time I had a hundred hives that I had done splits and I sold quite a few too, but, uh, I just, every time I go out there, there'd be three or four or five hives dead. And then I'd buy more Queens and, uh, just kept running in the same problem. I'm hoping next year will be a little bit better. Well, every year is different. The main thing is if you're going to do it for a living is you don't give up, you know, you got to yeah. make a lot of splits and hope for the best. And that's, I think I split them with all the rain this year. I think I split them too thin. Uh, and they didn't get a chance to really build up good, on, but they still just didn't come out and go. Well, sometimes when you make those late splits, like September, best to go into about three different hives and just pull a frame of seal brood from three different hives and add it to it. That way population jumps up pretty good. And that usually yeah. puts you ahead. It's those little things that I try to help people with that. They're not just thinking about how to, you know, survive. I mean, you can make one frame splits in the springtime, but as the season progresses, you've got to change your strategy. Well, I've started changing some. I was hoping this year to go in and if I'd have had as many hives now as what I was planning on having, I was wanting to go in and just overwinter a bunch of nukes and have some early ready to sell next year. Yeah. That's the best thing but, to do. Uh, what do you get for your I'm nukes that's overwintered out there? Uh, 220. 225. Well, uh, the shortage, I, you yeah. know, you might think about going up on it. Yeah. Right now, on my spring nukes, I got 200 on those. Yeah. Uh, like I said, it, as slow as they were making it, I had them promised and I had them sold. I just, it took a while to get them delivered. Uh, yeah. Just, they just were not populating like I need them to. Well, you're still feeding syrup, aren't you? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I've been syrup all year pretty well. I've been, you know, about three or four months in the winter. Yeah. And I've got dry sugar on them then. Yeah. Well, good. So, we're getting now. I'm learning. Uh, we'll get this house built. And next spring, I ought to be able to kick in and get back in it better. Like I said, I've kind of neglected them the last several months. Just too much other stuff going on. Yeah. Well, that's. That's the problem you get when you get, you know, a few hundred hives. Once you get up yeah. to when you hit the thousand and go over that, you know, it's basically a full time job. I mean, you don't have nothing else to do except bees day, daylight to dark every day. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, I've got mine spread out some. I'm doing the uh, egg management yeah. for people on the land. Yeah. And, uh, so I've got them spread out some now so they're all being in my yard. Uh, but we'll, we're going to get it rolling. I got about another year or a little over till I'm going to say retirement and just full-time bees. Well, are you grafting now or are you buying your, your queens already mated? No, I'm just, I'm buying queens mated right now. And then I make a lot of queens as far as just uh, pulling a frame of eggs out and put them in another hive, you know, make them queenless and let them build it. Well, that's kind of a slow way. If you start grafting and pull two grafts or three grafts a week, that way you have 500 cells going at all times. Yeah. I just, I haven't had the time to be able to do that yet. <laughs> we, we'll get in it next year. We'll, or actually not next year, but the year after. Uh, then I'll look at the grafting and going down that road. They'll give you an excuse, come over and take some classes. I'd love to. I'd love to. Uh, well, if Julie invites me Houston. back out there, I'll be out in Houston again if she invites me out there. Okay. Yeah. I, I didn't make it this late. You came down this summer, didn't you? No, was she was with, the, with the COVID, she didn't want me to come over. Oh, okay. Yeah. I know Probably you had a plan at one time. time. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love for you to come down. I'd love to get with you again. Oh, no. Nobody else wanting to talk? <laughs> Nobody else wants to talk. Everybody wants to stare at their screens all night. Raise those hands if you have a question. How was your honey flow this year? 
Uh, well, I'm not really in the honey business, but we, we kind of feed most of the time, you know, year round, but we didn't feed for like five to seven weeks there straight there because there was enough coming in and we was making splits with the honey. Yeah. I mean, that's, I'd rather make splits with honey than have to deal with people and, you know, it's that mentality. I can buy it cheaper at Walmart. So, you know, yeah. I just send them to Walmart, go there. If they're interested in honey, I sell it five gallon buckets or barrels and really not interested in doing that. I've got some buckets in the basement now. and I'll use it for making splits in the springtime. Well, I'm going to make around 300 pounds of honey. And this year we got 60. Well, it just, they didn't, I said, just, it was a weird deer. We started out with a hard freeze and I lost several out of it. Yeah. Uh, and then with all the rain, it just, they didn't make honey. Yeah. It's all spotty. I mean, there could be people, you know, a mile from me and they're making honey and I won't be making honey. It's just, it's hard to explain that to people just getting into beekeeping. Mm -hmm. I'm in two different bee clubs here, and I had a few that had just one or two hives in mm -hmm. the bee clubs, and they were talking about they made about 60 pounds of honey or 70, and then the ones that are a little bit bigger, they didn't hardly make any honey. Yeah. So one of those deals you kind of have to gauge it. Oh, yeah. Who's telling it now? A lot of times they don't tell you the truth neither, so you can't go with that. Yeah. Okay, looks like Matt has a question. So let's get Jay off the hook for a little bit. All right, over to Matt. Go ahead, Matt, unmute. I got a question for you. It's changing the subject a little bit. Okay. Uh, have y'all had any dealings with eucalyptus plywood? No, I had, uh, I used to use eucalyptus as treatment for high beetles, but eucalyptus plywood, I've never even heard of it. Well, I've got an opportunity to get uh, about a half a stack of it, probably about 30 or 40 sheets. And, you know, it's that good plywood. It's free. <laughs> it's good. It's free. Uh, if it's got soaked in uh, eucalyptus, more than likely you're, you're not even going to have a beetle problem. Well, it's actually, I mean, it is, it is eucalyptic wood. Oh, I would still think you wouldn't have much of a beetle problem. Oh, uh, no words. You think that would be good to use for baby boxes? Yeah. I use all kinds of wood. There's no wood that I don't use except cedar. I don't put cedar in a beehive. I've got sweet gum. I got yeah, black cherry, walnut, you name it. I got beehives made out of it. Well, see, I ain't went and got this wood yet. I just... One of my friends has got it. He's using about half of the bungle, and now he said he let me have the other half. And mm -hmm. uh, and I he said it was a little bit on the flimsy side. I don't know exactly what he's talking about there. I'm gonna go look at it tomorrow. Well, you could probably use for bottom boards and lids down to about half inch. Uh, if you're gonna go with five frame boxes, like for mate nukes and stuff like that. Now you can use it if you nail yeah, this is three quarter inch wood. Oh, well, you can use that for lids. Uh, if you're going to use it on a bottom board, I usually put a support right in the middle, crossways. That gives it extra support. It keeps it from bowing so much. And then, but now I don't know how flimsy it is. He just said it was it was more flimsy than, than regular plywood that you buy. So, like I said, I don't know nothing about it. I've never even heard of it, but I'm going to look at it tomorrow. I'd try it and see if it's free. What do you got to lose? Just time of building a box, I guess. <laughs> Man, it don't take long to do that. No, it don't. And plus, if I get about 20 or 30 sheets out of it, that builds several boxes. Yeah, you can get, uh, well, if you're going to build a box out of it itself, I don't know how the box would stand up. We tried uh, that Vantech. I mean, it'll stay pretty straight. Plywood, it seems to bow in or bow out on sideboards <laughs> for like deeps or, or mediums. Yeah. Well, Bars I've got lids, some, it works fairly good. I've got some uh, uh, 10 frame, uh, the box built out of regular plywood that I've had now for three years. And that's when I 
uh chance i got got uh, some free like i said some free plywood and they're look still holding up good they ain't bowing, ain't nothing but now i put a lot of paint on them yeah well the paint is a good thing you know you can use that uh, van tech i've used osb years ago for shipping boxes and we ended up using them out in the b yard for mating and they end up being out in the b yard five years but if you got a couple of good coats of latex on there you get some years out of them yeah well, I just didn't know if, any, if you've ever even heard of even that, even using it. I didn't know. I don't know nothing about it. I, I've never you know, heard of you, eucalyptus plywood, but if it's free plywood, <laughs> I'd be building something out of it. Well, you can Google it because, you know, you can Google anything. It said it's uh, actually got a life expectancy of 25 years. Yeah. But, I, you know, ain't nothing going to last 25 years. Don't take care of it. But yeah, uh, I don't know how true that would be anyway. But I don't know. I just wondered if anybody heard of that. But uh, I'm definitely going to try it. Like you said, it's free wood. Yeah, I'd do it. Okay. Well, that's really about the only question I got. I mean, okay. I just now got on the chat. Y'all just talking about getting ready for winter, ain't you? Yeah, t this is the time you need to go through your hive and start getting stuff prepared for, you know, yeah. nice snow coming in. <laughs> but uh that's all i really got okay appreciate it all right okay who else you want to call on dan or don we got nobody uh no hands we got, up we got someone new named mom let's let's ask mom what's going on <laughs> that would be me <laughs> i just changed my name to joy martin on her just now I just yep joy it. just signed up what's your question yeah. joy well um I've been listening to Don the Fat V Man chat for about five years now, and so I've been um, using the oxalic acid with the vaporizer wand. Mm -hmm. And now that I'm up to 17 hives, uh, last year I got the ProVap 110. Yeah, and a lot um, faster. It is, it is. And um, I've, I've always gone by the instructions where I close the hive up, you know, in the entrance and the uh, ventilation holes. It takes a while, but. Um, and so just recently I started increasing my, uh, where I'm from two grams to four grams. But if I, if I listen to your, um, the last few chat and you're going to start doing it three times in a, in a row, correct? And we're doing it. Well, see right now I'm getting ready for winter. So I'm going to do it each week. Okay. And I'm going to do it for three consecutive weeks. I'm going to check to see how things are doing. We'll probably do an alcohol wash on about maybe one to 3% of the hives just Basically, spot check, go down the row, and about every 15, 20 hives, maybe pull a little bit, see what's going on. Okay. Um, but you mentioned putting a block in it. There's some people that uh, drill holes in the back of their hive for. That's what I did. I, I don't do that. We just stick the vaporizer in the front. We don't even put a, a rag or a towel. Now, the hand one, we used to block it up, but uh, it keep, keeps more in there. But blowing it in with that ProVap, if you use a measure like what we're using, uh, you get plenty of coverage in there because you can see it coming out of the top, especially if you got a vent hole in the second or third box. Yes, sir. We use a, a half inch copper cap. It goes on copper tubing to seal off copper. And it basically, the guy that made my vaporizers for me, he made a bunch of them up. And that's what we use. It's a half inch cap with a little brass uh, welding stick to it for a handle and we do one scoop to a hive and we got good luck with that okay because if i do it again next weekend i'm not going to cover anything up except for the entrance i wouldn't even cover the entrance go faster. i feel like i feel like i can see all the vapor going out of the holes i'm like i'm not getting anything inside well it's really when, good that program blows it in with such force and then okay. what you're seeing is the bees start beating their wings and they're circulating it out Okay. All right, then. Yeah, be I, sure you wear a vaporizer with oh, that, too. I, I do, sir. I have that. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. And then um, one more question is, um, we know some of the sawmill, and if we cut up the wood, you know, to turn into boxes later, how long do you, after you cut it up in the right measurements, if, how long well, do you let if, the uh, wood sit before it shrinks up? Before are you, you cutting me with a bandsaw? Oh, I guess so. That's what it is. It's, it's somebody that my husband works with that has a, a sawmill, like a little portable one. Oh, that's probably a band mill. 
Okay. If you got two to three weeks, uh, I wouldn't worry about a whole lot of extra uh, measurements on it, you know, extra. Uh, okay. But if we build right off the sawmill, like on pine, when the bark falls off the pine, it's already around 23 to, uh, percent moisture content. What I usually do is when I'm making the sides, I cut the sides long enough that I can set my hive tool, stand it up vertically and have that much clearance extra. The side should be 19 and 1 8. So if you add that extra with a uh, hive tool, it's going to give you about a 30 second wider. And we've built hundreds of boxes and we never had a problem with them. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I think Jameson, you had a question. Go ahead, unmute. Yeah, you said you use uh, eucalyptus oil for hive beetles. How did you use? We was putting them in Crisco, mixing it up like a patty, and rolling it up like a little cigar, and poke it in the back of the hive. We had good luck with it, but you got to wear gloves because it'll burn your fingers. Because eucalyptus oil is pretty strong. Okay. And why don't you like cedar for building bee boxes? Your grandmother or your mother ever put it in a closet in the house? Not that I know of. Well, a lot of people did that, and that's to run the bugs out in the, the malls and things so that would get in their clothes. And most cedars will outgas when the sun hits them. And if you look up cedar, it, you can use cedar as a pesticide. Okay. I personally wouldn't, even if someone gave me cedar, for bee boxes, I wouldn't use it. It's good for jewelry boxes or something you want to keep other stuff in. But, you know, people say don't use oak or sweet gum. I got black walnut bee boxes, a lot of oak bee boxes. Now, students that's moving stuff around on a honey box, if you got a deep box and you made it out of oak, you can add about another 15 pounds to it. But they last long. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, All I got. Okay. Uh, looks like Melissa is up next. Go ahead, Melissa. Hey, Don. Hey, everybody. Hey. Um, kind of going off of a previous question. Um, I'm not sure I heard the answer. Like, how long should that lady let the wood sit after it's been milled? If you got, uh, if you're sawing like we do, we saw quite a bit, and we always got a few piles setting all the time. And if a pile's two to three weeks old, feel free to use it. I've had people buy saw wood right off my sawmill, go home and make bee boxes, no have no problems with it. So I talked to uh, a local sawmill owner who says that the one buy stock that they sell of uh, Eastern white pine will shrink to five eighths inch within a couple of months. And if I want my boxes to, shrink down to three quarters of an inch or six eighths, how, how thick should I be milling them? If you're buying it from a sawmill, I mean, they're gonna probably cut four quarters. So let it sit for a week, make sure it's not, when you put your hand on it, it's dripping wet. Now, some of those sawmills, when they get a load of wood in or a load of logs, they saw it up and it, you can put your fingers on it and it feels sticky. Most of the logs that we get, we get them from tree service companies, and usually they're on, on a pile or on the ground at least two to three weeks or sometimes a month before we ever get them. So a lot of times we get pine, the bark's already fell off of it. And if you have a moisture meter, you could stab it and you probably get around 20, 22% moisture content. And you don't wanna dry kill any of your wood anyhow. If you dry kill your wood down to seven or eight percent and you put it in your house, your house is probably running 11, 12 percent moisture content. It'll swell up the moisture in the air and just gather up water. So what's the, the moisture content that I want to use then? I wouldn't worry Once about moisture through. content. You know, if you're getting wood already cut, haven't cut it at four quarters and let it sit on sticks, put sticks between each row, let Stickers? it sit. There. <laughs> if it's white right time, right? you know, two weeks, three weeks, it's pretty dry. Okay. Uh, but I imagine that also varies by species, right? Well, white pine dries the fastest. Yellow pine's a little slower. Poplar's next. Oak is about, you know, down the road a little bit. Sweet gum and oak, uh, white oak and red oak, they dry a little slower. 
cherry and walnut slow. Nut trees are slow. Good you're not building know. cabinets, you know, so you're not dealing with a few thousands, you know, you're dealing with, you know, 30 seconds, 64, you know, but the bee, bees ain't going to complain. I've had well, boxes I, that, you know, that shrunk a little bit. You can buy an air grinder. It fits on uh, your electric drill or an air air grinder. If they've sh uh, shrunk down a little bit, you could run across there and just barely hit them. It's like knock a little sawdust off of them. Okay. It takes about 30 seconds. Yeah, that was another concern about the shrinkage, like making it too small for the frames to fit into. Yeah. Thank you, so sir. That's why, you know, you, you cut them at 19 and an eighth and then stand your hive tool vertically at the end. That way it shouldn't bind. It should fit in there freely. That way you'll have enough clearance for shrinkage. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. All right. And over to Ken. Go ahead, Ken. Uh, Don already touched on it. I just wanted to add, if you do have a tree surgeon that you're going to, and it's the type of person that has stacks of them, I'm lucky I got a guy I'm going to, he's got stacks of trees all over his property. Go for the oldest looking ones first and ask him if he knows how long they've been there. Because if it's been eight, 10 months that they've been stacked, and the ones that are stacked on top of each other, the ones that are up off the ground, they'll be pretty dry. They, they'll dry a little bit, they'll shrink a little bit, but it is hardly even noticeable. Uh, I've got some pine uh, now that's been cut for so long, it's pretty much completely dry. But uh, if you if you know the guy you're getting it from, just ask him if he knows how long that stuff's been cut, and it'll take away a whole lot of the shrinking problem from when you're building. And that's it. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, no questions up again. Let's see if Christine's paying attention. <laughs> Go ahead, Christine, you're up. Unmute. I'm here. I'm um, doing double duty. I'm babysitting my grandbaby. So I'm like up and down, around and around and catching things as they're flying off the shelves and <laughs> trying to just trying to listen in. <laughs> you got any questions about bees? Oh, well, I got about a million questions about bees, but I can't think of a, a, one of them right this moment. <laughs> I'm still dealing with having to feed um, for the first time. I'm having to feed all, um, I am think I'm going to have to feed all winter. And so I'm buying sugar at the Costco mm -hmm. and, uh, or Costco or Winko, it's about the same price. And my husband helps me. We mix it up within a five gallon bucket. I only have a few hives and we go up there and we fill in the feeders and the bees are happy. We cut a five frame nuke deep down to make a medium for the top of a of a nuke that I'm trying to winter over in the smaller box without having to put it in an eight frame because but my guy who usually makes boxes for me um he he wasn't making boxes so I just cut one that I had down to size and that worked out really cool today yeah not a whole lot weather's warm um October just as usually a beautiful month here in California. So you got any honey left at all? I I have honey from a neighbor left. Well, like you might want to do some honey in, a, in like two ounce bottles. Go to the manager of Costco and you know because they have kids that stack and sugar all the time. And tell them you're a beekeeper. And if they got any broken bags or tore bags, you'll be glad to take them off his hands. More than likely, he'll give them to you because they basically don't want to sell them for liability. And tell them, say, you're a beekeeper. You'll give them a little bit of honey. It always sweetens the deal up. You'd be surprised. You get some free sugar. Kroger's a good, another place like that. I'll try that. Yeah. I mean, I tell people how to get free paint, and they don't blame me. I've got students that they pay to haul the paint off. Oh, wow. You never should have to buy paint. That's the, the beauty of a, a chat. I share a lot of information, save you money. Well, I've got a ton of paint samples lying in the walls of my garage. Mix them all together, come up with a happy color. <laughs> <laughs> I actually just stopped painting my bee boxes and just leave them natural. They'll last a lot longer if you put an ugly paint on them than just natural. <laughs> because the weather gets to that wood, it warps it up. It uh, causes the joints to swell in it. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Don. Okay. I have a. Oh, sorry. We lost you, Mark. Christine. 
Okay, we'll come back to you. Uh, Melissa, go ahead. Hey, Don, could you talk some about uh, sawmill suggestions? Like, what would you recommend looking at or for? Uh, if you're buying a sawmill, basically, there's no real big trick to it. If you're buying it, buy it to use and don't worry about selling it. If you're thinking about buying something and selling it later, buy something that's got a good name on it. You know, it's like vehicles, you know. You want to buy a good work truck, you buy a Dodge. You want to buy something to trade, you buy Ford and Chevy. You know, it's got a higher resale value. Woodmiser's got one of the top uh, resale values to it. But I get a lot of people come up, watch me saw, go out and buy sawmills. There's no big secret to it. The biggest thing that I can tell you is learn to sharpen your own blades or have your blades sharpened by somebody who knows what they're doing. I sharpen blades for quite a few people. And I have many of them say that the blades after they're resharpened cut much better than right out of the box buying them new because blades that you buy right out of a box are stamped out. They're not really preset. The one I got an automatic setter and grinder down there, profiler. It sets it to within a one thousandth of an inch from one side to the other. So basically, it's going to run straight through knots, whatever. You know, if you hit nails, I mean, you can have to resharpen it and hope for the best. But is you can buy a cheap sawmill, will cut you just as good a lumber as a $50,000 sawmill. Just the blade is your most important part. I'm going to have to take one of those lessons soon. Um, and do you? see an advantage to uh, a band mill as opposed to like the chainsaw kind? Well, I tried a chainsaw when I was broke and I couldn't afford nothing. And two logs will fill up a, a pickup truck with sawdust. I can set my wood miser out there and I can't fill up a pickup truck with about five or six semi loads of logs. I'm taking out 17 thousandths of an inch of sawdust and a chainsaw will take out darn near a half inch. If you cut down the grain, look, it looks like long noodles coming out. And you, that's a lot of wood you're wasting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. wood, uh, Harbor Freight's got them for $2,000. And on Facebook right now, there's there's a wood miser for $10,000, which is a good deal. Got a good markup on it. So 2000 or 10000 they're all going to cut wood. You just make sure you keep your blade sharp. The only difference is horsepower. You know, you're going to have to spend fifteen thousand dollars to get something to turn the logs for you, hydraulics or another machine, a tractor or something. So, I can set a forty-eight inch oak log up there, sixteen or eighteen foot long, and I pull a lever and it turns it over for me. I'm getting too old to flip it over with a, a big old cant hook. And then right. the, a twenty-five horse motor is going to cut a lot faster than a Harbor Freight six and a half horsepower. Those you have to push. If the blade ain't sharp, you push hard. If it's cut right and sharpened right, I have a guy that's got a Hudson and it's basically a, a manual mill. He said he had a push with two hands, blades right out of the box. And when I sharpened them, he put his finger against the head and pushed it down sawn wood. It's like a chainsaw. If you sharpen it right, it'll pull itself through the wood. May I take one of those sharpening lessons with you next time? If you buy the same brand of a sharpener, you know, most uh, sharpeners have got their own characteristics. All right, what's the brand I'm looking for? If you're gonna spend the money on a, a bandsaw, buy a good one. I got a Cook's setup, it's $4,000. Setting in profile, you get to cut a new profile. You, you cut the tips off with a nail, it, it'll cut the, uh, it'll reshape the tips out for you. You can buy a cheap setter, I mean, I've seen them on uh, Facebook for three and four hundred dollars. They're designed to sharpen chainsaws, but there's no accuracy in it. It just grinds metal off, and you hope for the best. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Over to Patricia. Go ahead, Pat. Hi, everybody. I found the unmute button right off the bat tonight. It's pretty good. <laughs> good girl. <laughs> um. As far as uh, the moisture level in your wood, there are plans on the internet for building a solar kiln. And I've seen a couple of them in use. They work really well. They'll bring the moisture down in just a few weeks time. And um, you can build it so you can load it with your tractor 
If you have the tines for loading hay, uh, round hay bales, you can load it in with that, or you can uh, load it in by hand, Build, start out building whatever you can handle by yourself with the intent of building up from there. But the solar kilns work real well if you're worried about the shrinkage on your boards. That's all. All righty. If you want to make a, a kill, I mean, you could go, people know what a, a dry box is. It's those big semi-trailers or shipping containers. They work wonderful. They got doors on the back, two swing out doors. You go down to like uh, the big box store and buy you a, about a 5,000 BTU air conditioner, mount that in there and get a little box fan and set it in the back. And within 10 to 14 days, you're down low. Pulls the moisture right out. Now the poor man's way of doing it is get some old tin, stack up all your wood on your sticks, put some tin over the top, then put some old slabs on top of that so it don't dry too fast. And you know, that's one thing I try to explain to people. They think they gotta buy kill dried wood. Well, three and 400 years ago when they made Stradivariuses, they didn't have kill dries. They let it air dry naturally. And it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, so. Yeah. Think I mean, more along the lines of what's easy and economical rather than right. trying to be big, mm -hmm. grow big, but don't try to be big right off the bat. Yeah, you can go uh, broke going big. You can, because you know it, <laughs> they'll sell you anything. If you call up and ask them, they will sell you whatever you're looking for. But it might be something that you can do just as easily without having to put out a lot of money up front, build towards making that big purchase later on when you're really need it this is the time of the year you want to get rid of all your bee catalogs because everybody gets bee catalogs this time of the year and when they go into the toilet they sit there with a pad and a pencil and they mark all these things down they think they need and you end up with hundreds of dollars of stuff you don't need <laughs> all right looks uh jameson i believe had a question go ahead jameson I didn't have a question. Oh, I thought I seen your hand go up. Oh, oh no, I was, I got bugs in this house. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> All right. I think uh, Jeff wants to say something. All right, Jeff, your turn. What do you got to? Oh. Yeah, I actually, I think Pat can appreciate this one. I got two items, but uh, the other day I spent an hour up the emergency room after being bit right on the side of the head on the eyelid by a wasp Ooh. and I got myself a nice reaction to it. I tell you, that's the first time I've ever had a, uh, I guess you call it a allergic reaction to a bee bite, swollen mm -hmm. lip, the whole nine yard dizziness. Wasp bite. <laughs> yeah, wasp are, the... Wasps are different. They can yeah. inject venom when they bite and they can bite oh. repeatedly. You need to yeah. make sure you have an EpiPen with you now that you've had a yeah, reaction. I got... Please I got EpiPens now. Yeah. yeah, I got EpiPens now. Uh, but I tell you, I hit the Benadryl and I thought, well, I didn't think it was going to be an issue. And I, next thing I know, I'm kind of like, okay, this is not going well. Yeah. <laughs> well the, something, the something that I didn't know is that you should take an, an acid also. There is, a, really? uh, histamine, there is a histamine pump in your stomach that reacts with yeah. the histamines that you get from the bite oh, yeah. and it will work yeah. with the Benadryl to calm it down. Right. You still need to go to the emergency right. room. You still need the EpiPen and all that, yeah. but yeah. Uh, an antacid yeah. will help, especially with a minor reaction. And, yeah, that was uh, uh, quite a surprise. Careful. Yeah, that was quite a surprise. I mean, I, I've had several, I get honeybee bites all the time, never, ne never an issue, but this one was a good one. Mm -hmm. uh, I got a, I got one, I'm getting all of the hives ready for winter. So some will go into the heated shed, uh, insulated shed, and the rest will go into uh, underneath the deck and on pallets and uh, insulated. Um, I got one hive that was a swarm. Looks like it's not queen right. Uh, I've been checking it carefully over the last couple of weeks, no laying queen in it. So I'm, gonna, I'm thinking about merging it with uh, another one of my uh, swarm boxes that's got a queen that's laying. Um, I was thinking, uh, 
I know you can do the sheet of paper routine or you can do a, uh, just to be on the extra safe side, I could probably put a clean excluder than the paper. I don't know if you had if you have any particular thoughts on that. If you're worried, you know, where you're at, where you couldn't get cleans, do you got any extra yeah. clean cages? Uh, I do, but it's going to be too late in the year. Even if you, it's going to be two weeks from now, we're going to be deep winter and probably but right now it's actually put her in a queen cage with a little bit of a uh, mix up your own candy, put a little bit in the end and then just put yeah. it in there and just dump the two hives together. That way yeah, when okay. it comes out, you know, she should be all right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a possibility. Or you can spray them no, down, I... you know, in South Georgia, when we're combining hives up, if you've got two weak ones, we just give them a spray yeah. and then just dump them. Right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Other than that, that's it for now. Uh, actually, this year has been really good up here in the north, in New England. Uh, great summer. Nice. Yeah. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of swarm cells and all that. Um, so many so that, uh, I mean, it had calls from around the county up here. Aroostook County is the biggest county on the East Coast. And uh, uh, the bee population must be spreading all over the place because we had calls from all types of towns. There was houses in the, oh my God. Well, we were trying to add the Amish out. Uh, I, I took care of two. One was underneath a trailer of all places. Uh, but I think I had like, uh, total 12 swarms that I took care of this year. Yeah, three bees always so, good. So it was the, uh, oh yeah, it was, it was a quite interesting year this year. Yeah. But other than that, that's, that's it for now. Okay. Okay. All right, uh, go ahead, Pat. I got a phone call last week. This woman was just about hysterical on the telephone, crying and carrying on. The bees were after them. The air was full of bees. Oh, Lord, she'd never seen so many bees, and the sound was deafening. She just carried on and was really hysterical over these bees. She had seen a swarm come into her yard. So we got our mess and went over there, and it was about that big around about a batch of bees. She seen a little cloud of bees come in and thought the world was ending. She just knew that the killer bees had come to get her. <laughs> I've never seen anybody get so upset over them. But late season swarms, uh, if you get them to live, is a miracle. They, they don't tend to do well because they don't have enough stores and supplies and stuff to, to make it. But we got them in a box. But yeah. You would have thought the world was in and the poor woman saw a swarm come in. You know, we get swarms, you know, a lot of our yards and, you know, it depends on how you're managing your hives. You can pull one frame of honey out of three different hives and put it in that swarm box and those bees will go through the winter. I've seen bees in my backyard, I'm at the edge of the mountains, the size of your fist, January up into February and students will look at them and say, never going to make it. And as soon as the warm weather comes, they exploded out and, and just did fine. If the queen is good, you don't have mites and they look healthy and they don't starve, they go through the winter, they usually come back really fast. So if it's a small swarm, I wouldn't give up on them. Okay, uh, to Melissa, go ahead. Yeah, I had a, a 10 frame lid on an eight frame box and I have my entrance reducers in as it's fall and there's a lot of robbing going on. And uh, I noticed a cluster of bees hanging underneath the lid. And at first I thought it was part of the bearding. I've just figured the hive was hot. It's packed pretty full of bees and has been very productive all season long. But it hung out there for about three days. So I went and grab some extracted honey frames and one with actual capped honey on it and a blank one for them to work on and put a box underneath them and let them go in. So uh, I think if you have resources to allocate, it's uh, beneficial, especially in catching late season swarms. And based on what you said, Don, I'm pretty optimistic about them making it because I've got the resources this late in the season to contribute. Well, did you so, find the queen in there? You know what? Honestly, I didn't even look. But the way that after I got the majority of them 
to go into the box just by putting a box up underneath that lid. Um, several followed still. Um, some stuck I around. I'm sure you have a queen because when you say you put a friend to extract it in there, even if it wasn't a queen in there, they will migrate in that box to smell that open honey in there. But now if well, you I'll find a queen it. in there, I'd go to a couple hives and pull some sealed brood out and put it right with that. Make sure you got a queen though. I wouldn't I'm going to do that out. tomorrow when I get all these hives that I just put on the truck and trailer uh, unloaded. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> tomorrow or the next day. It's a 12 hour drive. So uh, I think after this, we'll have one more trip to get them all. And I'm pretty sure I made my goal at 250 this year. So thanks, Don. Yeah, yeah. Okay, who's next? Tick tock, tick tock. What do you want, Don? Well, let's see who we haven't we picked on yet. <laughs> we haven't heard from Bruce. Let's see what Bruce got to say. Bruce, you're up. Let's hear about it. Maybe he doesn't want to talk. He must fell asleep. Sleeping. Yeah, could be. You know, a lot of people don't understand it. If they look on my webpage under Don's Keepers, you can look all around the states and you can find one of my keepers close to you. Now, there's a good resource if you need bees. Uh, and you can, there's phone numbers there. You can talk to them. If you're thinking about getting into bees to make a living, call the students, talk to them, find out. Because they'll tell you up front, you know, they're not around me, so they ain't got nothing to fear from me. They'll tell you what a bad guy I am and what a good guy I am, whatever, you know, but you have an opportunity to be self-employed and make a living and you can make money in bees. Uh, talk to the students. Uh, that's one good way to get good, uh, good stock out there and get on the list to get the bees. You want bees, you can work, not bees that are so mean you have to have five suits on and hope they don't have a tear in them. Mm. Okay. I think that's, if there's no more questions, we can call it a night. I've got nine o'clock here. Going once, Nobody going twice. Them. All right. Thank you, Don. Thank you, everyone. We will see you in two weeks. All right. Appreciate the extra chat. Have a good evening.